Ještě udělám takový check. Is here anyone who does not understand? Check. Okay, so I will switch to English. Um, <laughs> no, you don't have to. No, just for the intro and the, for the first presentation. Uh, we will use uh, Czech language in English. Or you can try Czech. Uh, Scott, you can go <laughs> oh, it's because the output is set. Okay. So we're still testing our live stream. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming uh, to WeWork, uh, to the presentation. Uh, it's called the, the event. It's called .NET uh, Days with Scott Hanselman. And we have uh, one special speaker as well. Uh, you, will hear, you will hear her first, uh, the first talk from, from her. So, few logistical things. Uh, we have uh, WeWork uh, here hosting us. Uh, so, thanks to you, thanks, thanks to WeWork for uh, having us here. Uh, they are kindly providing coffee, tea, and some water. So, during the breaks, you can ask the great person barista there who is not there right now, uh, but you can ask him to, uh, to, uh, for the coffee or tea or whatever. Then uh, restrooms, uh, you can find restrooms upstairs. Uh, there are some uh, signs, so I'm sure you can find it. Uh, and then uh, I would like to invite, and now I need to make sure I will pronounce the name correctly, Dina Golchatovska from the WeWork. Uh, she will tell us something about, the, about this place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Tina. Good job, Oscar. Well done. Uh, I'm part of the community team here at WeWork, uh, Prague, and I'm community lead. So we are a team of four, and we're based at the reception. So feel free to, after this event to come and chat to us if that's something of your interest to learn more about the place and what we do, how we do it. We've been in Prague for two months now, fully in the building. We opened first two floors in September, and then the rest of the building, which is five floors, and is in space um, in October. So it's a new concept. We're really excited about this, so we're happy to show you around if maybe you're looking for a place to work at. So welcome. As uh, my colleague already said, feel free to grab a coffee from Paris, start or tea, and browse around and chat to us after the end. Um, finishes. Welcome. Thank you again. And now we can move our first speaker. Uh, so I will now switch back to Czech. Takže naším prvním přednášejícím nebo přednášející je Vendulka Voltrová, která nám ukáže, no, ukáže nám, jakou hru vytvořila pomocí aplikace Maker Code. Takže je to tvoje. Tak já vás tedy vítám, já se jmenuji Vendura Voltrová a ještě než začnu, tak bych chtěla moc poděkovat všem díky, kterým tady můžu dneska být, což je hlavně moje rodina a ještě víc můj tatínek, protože ne nebejt mě i tak bych vám teď nemohla představit pět důvodů, proč mám ráda Makeout Arcade a proč mě programuje. Na začátek něco o mně, je mi 13 let, bydlím v Plzni, kde navštěvuju gymnázium a kromě programování mám i další koníčky, jako je plavání, stolní tenis, hra na akordeon a také si ráda hraji se svým pejskem. Poprvé jsem začala programovat asi v pěti letech a už jsem zkoušela programovat ve Scratchi, v Kodu Game Lab, Le Lego Mindstorm, právě v Makeup Arcade a nyní začínám programovat Arduino. Teď už se dostáváme k TOP 5 Proč Makeup Arcade. Je to moderní nástroj, programuje se v něm velmi lehce, ale pokud vás to přestane bavit, můžete snadno přepnout do JavaScriptu. Také se tam cvičíte tu programátorskou angličtinu a snadno se v tom vytváří hry ve stylu 80. let. Uh, proč je to moderní nástroj? No, je, uh, hlavně proto, že všechny vytvořené hry i samotný make jsou open source a jsou, te, dají se jednoduše sdílet i s kódem, takže je může někomu nazdílet a ten si může upravit tu hru a vytvořit si nějakou vlastní hru. 
A tím, že jsou on online, tak si je můžeme otevřít i na mobilním telefonu nebo tabletu. Také se dají jednoduše vadit a můžeme je nahrát do herní ko do ruční konzole, kterou si vyrobíme doma, kterou vám teď ukážu. Zde můžete vidět, jakou mám já. Mám v, něm už, mám v ní už nahranou hru, kterou jsem vytvořila. Je to tedy zatím jenom první level. Můžete ho najít také na mém Twitteru, kde si ho můžete zahrát. A nyní zpátky k prezentaci. Takže si ty hry můžeme nahrát do té, do té herní konzole. Proč je to lehká forma programování? To je hlavně proto, že jsou zde bloky, takže se ten kód nepíše ale jsou zde ty příkazy už předpřipravené, jsou barevně odlišené a jsou v angličtině, což mě se teď třeba hodí, když ještě chodím do školy. Dále jsou zde třeba tutoriály s návodem, takže pro začátečníky se... Takže začátečníci si v tom můžou vytvořit nějakou jednoduchou hru s návodem. Také zde můžeme najít takzvané coding card, kde jsou různé situace, se kterými se můžeme setkat a jak na ně máme reagovat. Dále jsou zde ukazové hry pro srovnání, takže pokud nebudeme vědět, jak máme něco udělat, tak se můžeme kouknout do té hry a porovnat si to a třeba se inspirovat. Pokud zrovna neumíme kreslit nebo nemáme suprového grafika jako já, čímž je moje segra, které bych teď chtěla moc poděkovat, tak si můžeme herní prvky vybrat z galerie, kde je jich spoustu. A také si ty bloky můžeme rozšířit třeba o šipky nebo animace. Zde vidíme ty bloky. Jsou barevně odlišené a skladají se takhle do sebe. Můžeme také přepnout do JavaScriptu, který je také barevně odlišen, takže je to lehčí. A je zde nabídka z příkazy, takže pokud v něm neumíme úplně rovnou psát, tak můžeme těmi příkazy je tam vkládat vlastně z té nabídky. Také je zde editor obrázků přímo ve zdrojovém kódu a také to podporuje více zdrojových souborů v rámci jedné hry. Tady můžeme vidět, že třeba funkce jsou tmavé modré nebo muzika je růžová a že je to tím také odlehčené. Ta angličtina vlastně Makeout, nějaké verze Makeoutu, jako je například BBC Microbit, tak je přeložený do češtiny, zatímco Makeout Arcade je jenom ve třech jazycích, z čehož já umím jenom češtinu, ale, uh, angličtinu, pardon, ale je to i lepší, když pak přecházíme třeba do toho JavaScriptu, nebo já teď přecházím do Arduino, takže to vidím, že když si to porovnáme, takže tohle je z Makeout Arcade, tamhle to je z Makeout BBC Microbit a tohle je ten JavaScript a vidíme, že je to mnohem víc podobnější než třeba v tom BBC Microbit. Tam se používá třeba nějaká pravda, nepravda, zatímco v Makeoutu se používá true a normálně jako programování. Dají se zde tedy vytvořit plnohodnotné hry ve stylu 80. let, takže, podpo takže to podporuje sprity, u kterých můžeme učit nějaké fyzikální vlastnosti, jako je například pozice nebo rychlost, také můžeme měnit jejich vzhled a nebo si tam teda dondat ty střely. A 
Zkrátí se dají ovládat klávesnicí, nebo je zde i možnost pro hru pro více hráčů. A také zde jdou dělat nějaké otázky nebo dialogy a můžeme tam přidat i nějaké zvuky. A takže můžeme říct, že když třeba se jeden sprite dotkne druhého, takže to zahraje nějaký zvuk. Přes ty kolize se dostáváme ke scéně, kde můžeme rozlišovat i kolizi sprite s nějakou barvou podlahy třeba a můžeme taky hýba, také hýbat nebo třást s kamerou. Také můžeme počítat skore nebo životy. Dále můžeme tedy upravovat vzhled, třeba můžeme obrázek rovnou převrátit a neho znovu překreslovat. V rozšířeních také můžeme najít třeba ty střely nebo animace. Právě jsme dokončili první, první level, čímž byla tedy přednáška. A nyní se vrhneme na level druhý, kterým je ukázka. Nyní jsem na stránka Makeodu Arcade a tady si vytvořím nějaký nový projekt. Nějak ho pojmenuji. A počkám, až se to načte. Zde se přepíná do JavaScriptu, tady se může přibližovat, oddalovat a tady je ta nabídka. Nejdřív, protože budu chtít hru, kde bude pizza střílet po člověkovi v menší pici, takže potřebuju ty střely, které najdu v těch rozšířeních. A zase musím počkat, až se to načte. Nyní si vytvoříme nějakého našeho hrdinu. Který bude tedy vypadat jako pizza. A bude to hráč. Teď si musíme vytvořit nějakého nepřítele. Který bude člověk. Třeba nebo kačenku si tam můžeme. A bude to nepřítel. Teď chci, protože takhle se objevily oba dva na stejném místě, ale já chci, aby ten nepřítel byl po každé jinde, takže určím jeho pozici. A použiju matematiku, takže to vybere náhodné číslo. Protože vím, že maximální rozměry obrazovky jsou 160 a 120 a nechci, aby chodil úplně ke kraji, takže tam dám třeba 30 a 135. A na Y dám 30 a 110. Nebo 110. Hmm. Nyní potřebuji, aby se náš hrdina hýbal, když budu mačkat šipky, takže to zařídím takhle. A teď dáme, aby tedy střílel ty šipky. Dám to, že když zmáčknu Ačko, tak aby střílel šipky. Bude vypadat tedy jako menší pizza, pardon. A ještě jsem si teď všimla, že tady jsem zapomněla dát, že nepřítel je dvojka, takže takhle. Už to funguje. A teď potřebuji, protože takhle by se ta šipka jenom vytvořila, tady. A nikam by nešla a navíc se vytvoří v rohu, 
Takže když dám tady, tak můžu dát ty pozice, kde se vytvoří, což dám ty pozice toho mýho hrdiny. Protože tady je to Y, tak tady musí být taky Y. Nyní tedy zařídím, aby ta šipka, aby tu šipku hodil, protože jinak by jenom tam zůstala stát. A tady ještě nastavím, že to nebude hráč, ale že to bude šipka. Potřebuji ty kolize, že když se nepřítel, když nepřítel nabourá do šipky, tak aby, aby to přičetlo bod. Takže tady v informacích je skore. Takže ho vyměníme o jedna a zase nastavíme náhodnou tu pozici, takže se může nám to rozkopírovat, aby byl po každé jinde. A ještě se musím dát, že zkontroluje, jestli není skoro větší než třeba pět, protože pokud by bylo, tak aby už ukončil hru. To jsem použila logiku, tady použiju ještě jednou. Takže pokud bude skore, pokud se bude skore rovna 10, 5 třeba, takže dáme game over. A ven. Teď by tam ta šipka ale zůstala na pořád, takže musím dát, aby to zničili tu šipku. A sem dám, že ne mýho sprajta, ale tu šipku, aby to zničilo. Teď to můžeme zkusit. Ano, teď se útočí na kačenku. V realitě by to bylo spíš naopak, ale to nevadí. Takže jsem nazbírala pět bodů a tím jsem vyhrála. Express M4, uh, which is produced by Adafruit, which is you can buy it even in Czech, so no problem. There is a small SPI display, and there is big battery, which is 
more like half of this box is battery and charger and, and, and that's all. Uh, on, on this it's a bit thick board, it's uh, ARM based board, uh, you just upload custom uploader or bootloader there, you just connect it to, you just connect it to USB and hit download button on the on the on the make code and you choose the right board because you can upload it in the Raspberry Pi Zero and other stuff and you just drag and drop on the on the USB drive which will happen when you connect this and, and that's all. So it's uh, for let's say normal skillet people it takes like one hour to, to build it and if you have 3D printer you can print some box on it and that's all. or you can buy in China some already done version uh, if you're not skillet enough or you don't have 3D printer. začít s nějakým uh, normálním programovacím jazykem, když jsi něco zkoušela. No, teď začínám to Ardu, Arduino, takže potom... To je Cčko. Takže to začínám, ty základy mám i k tomu knížku jako příročku, takže to spíš nějak kombinuju to, co je v té knížce. A uvidím. Anyone watching? Yes. Um, you say hi. Um, nine people. Uh, nine people. Nine people. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, no, I so we are live again. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I should even introduce you. Uh, is there anyone who Hello. just Hello. know? Who is this? Who is this person? <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my name is Scott Hanson. So, yeah, my name is Scott. Uh, I work for Microsoft, uh, and um, I'm not here to sell you anything. Uh, everything that I work on is open source and free. I feel very strongly about that. I went to Microsoft 10 years ago to open source everything. Uh, and I'm going to keep open sourcing stuff until they fire me. So uh, if, if you ever read the news that I've been fired, you'll know I tried to open source something. A notepad or you know, Minesweeper. And they're like, that's too much. And then they kick me out. Uh, that was pretty amazing. You feel good? You're like, ah. <laughs> four issues like this. I'm always nervous before a talk, and then there's just like this, ah, afterwards. It's like, it's like jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> Giving a speech is like jumping out of an airplane, where it's like, this is stupid. This is stupid. I'm going to give a talk, and you jump out of the airplane, and you're like, that was amazing. When can we do it again? <laughs> so I, I look forward to seeing you give the presentations at the big conferences. This was great. You, you, you had a whole packed house talking about your stuff, and everyone on Twitter is excited to see this. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we're going to do a talk about diabetes, and then we're going to take a break, and then we'll talk about .NET afterwards. And feel free to stay for whichever parts make you happy. So this, uh, this talk, plus her talk, I think are really good examples of what you can do with the power of software and the power of open source and the ease at which you can solve complicated problems. Um, the idea that, that you can make a game and run it on the PC and then run it on a tiny device and with, with as much ease and elegance as she showed us is amazing if you think about I've been programming for 30 years. Like that was hard. Sprites and collision and all the stuff that was happening. So it's really exciting that we can solve really hard problems. There's seats up here in the front too. If you want. <coughs> There's seats up here. Feel free to sit where you want. Here I'll move. I'll move my diet coat and you can sit there. If you want. So this is a talk called "Solving Diabetes with an Open Source Artificial Pancreas." I am a type one diabetic. This is an invisible disability that I have. Um, this is a thing to think about when you when you look around at your your neighbors and your coworkers. You don't know what their story is. <coughs> you don't know if they have a wooden leg, or they were in the in the military, or if they have a disability, or depression, or any kind of medical issue. Diabetes is my issue, but I don't have to tell you that. I can choose to hide it if I want to. But I choose to tell people about it because it is a, a chronic illness that will kill me, and it sucks. Uh, are there any type 1 diabetics here? Okay. Needles? Pump? What do you got? Pump? 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 Pump. Three pumpers here. This is cool. When you see a, when you see pumpers, we have to, like, clink pumps. Go, and we have to, like, when you say, cheers, what do you say when you have, like, a drink? You go, clink. When we find an insulin pump person, we touch pumps in the streets. <laughs> this is an insulin pump, and uh, it's connected to me 24-7, all the time. Okay, It's implanted. I have to sleep with it, so it goes underneath the pillow. And I have to be careful when I'm sleeping that I don't turn twice in any one direction, because I'll die. Just kidding. I'll just rip the tube out. Uh, in fact, last night I was uh, had to pee, as one does. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and the pump was there, and I just kind of went out like that, and I pulled it right out, and I was holding it while I'm walking to the bathroom, and then it hit the door, <laughs> the doorknob, just ripped it right out of me. If you like grab it and run past the door, it's quite painful. This is connected 24-7, and I've also got another implant. That's a Bluetooth with a battery that's called a CGM. I'm going to talk about all of those things. Now, we've got three other pumpers here. 
but a lot of people don't use pumps, they use needles. We're going to talk about those things as well and the problems that one might want to solve when they have uh, diabetes and that it sucks. First, a little advertising. I have a podcast. You should listen to it. I've done over 712 episodes. Excuse me. It's about 30 minutes long. It's a very good show for anyone that doesn't care about what programming language you like. It's just about techies talking about cool stuff. In fact, I had this man on who is a doctor who said he is making a bionic pancreas. The pancreas is the, um, the organ that I have that doesn't do anything. It's the broken organ. He said in 2014, five years ago, that he was going to fix this. I've been diabetic for almost 30 years, and every year they have told me that they're going to fix it in five years. But just hang in another five years. Is that, is that a fair statement? How long have you been diabetic? 25 years, 30 years, 25 years. How many, other, how many years? 10 years, all the same. 10 years, exactly, all the same. Universal. Another year. Next year, there's a new thing coming out. It's going to fix everything. It's going to be great. Uh, just like self-driving cars, right? Everyone who has a self-driving car, right? They're coming next year. You know? <laughs> it's not going to happen. No. Now, any time that you give a talk about health and fitness, you have to show a picture of yourself being fit. I don't know who that guy is. I just found this on the clip art. This is just a Google Images guy. I'm not fit. My, uh, my sports injuries are all Netflix related. <laughs> Last night I had an injury. I was burned very badly because the iPad fell on my face while I was watching Netflix and it burned me at night. And, like, ah. and then I looked at it and it was like episode 9. And I started on episode 1, so like 8 episodes on my face while I was sleeping. Okay. Here's me uh, when I was doing my IT work early on. <laughs> so I've written about diabetes on my blog for about 15 years. And let's talk about the basics of type 1 diabetes. There are two kinds of diabetes. Unfortunately, they have the same name. They should not be named the same. Everyone who hears that I'm diabetic, they say, oh, my grandmother is also diabetic. Or my uncle is also diabetic. That's a different kind of diabetes. That's called diabetes type 2. This is not your grandma's type 2. The difference is, with type 2 diabetes, you can often manage it with pills, with exercise, with different diet. It's a metabolic disease where you're not using your own insulin correctly. I have type 1 diabetes, along with these other folks here who are also type 1, which means my pancreas makes no insulin. I have a non-working organ. It would be like having non-working lungs or non-working whatever. If it doesn't work, it must be replaced. So I make zero insulin. If I stopped getting <coughs> insulin, I would be dead in about two weeks. Okay, so this is a big deal. It's, it's not, not something that you get from eating too much sugar. It's just shit happens. It's one of those things. Sorry, I swore in English. Is that bad? Well, the young people. You know what? You know that word? I apologize. Don't, 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 don't say that. <laughs> Stuff happens. <laughs> okay. Here's the basics. Food raises your blood sugar. Okay. And if you have anything you eat. Whatever it is, if you eat candy, if you eat food, if you eat a hamburger, if you have a Coke, whatever it is, it becomes sugar. If you eat meat, it becomes sugar. If you eat sugar, it becomes sugar. It goes into your bloodstream like gasoline, like, you know, petrol, and it goes through your, your, your bloodstream. And it goes through your bloodstream and it is being prepared to be delivered to the cells. So you eat something, it goes in the bloodstream, the sugar in your bloodstream, blood sugar, and it's going, 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 and then it's being delivered to the cells. Insulin opens the doors. Imagine, imagine that your bloodstream is a hallway with doors. Insulin opens the hallway doors and lets the sugar out and turns it into energy. If you don't have any insulin, then you have just more and more and more sugar being pumped into the bloodstream. It has nowhere to go. 
So you know the word marinating? When you marinate a steak, or you marinate, you're actually marinating in your own sugar. You can actually smell it. When you have so much sugar in your body that your body is overflowing, you pee it out, it comes out of your mouth, your pores, you smell like candy because you are steeped in your own sugar. A lot of people don't understand diabetes, and they don't understand why it breaks people, why people die of it. Diabetics die of diabetes. We don't die of old age. We die of this. And you might hear that diabetics lose their sight. Number one cause of blindness. Number one cause of amputation. Liver disease, heart disease. But why feet? Why do you lose your feet? Why do you lose your sight? That's kind of a weird thing. How does sugar make your eyeballs rot and make your toes fall off? What's, where are the tiniest veins, the little tiny, tiny, tiny veins? In the eyes and in the toes. So in America, when we make our tea, we have these bears. They're like a honey bear. It's like a squeezy bear. Do you have this kind of thing? If you just, it looks like a bear. You squeeze it, and you put the honey in the tea. You know how the top of the bear or the top of the honey jar gets kind of sugary and crystalline, and you have to put it under hot water to make the sugar go away? If sugar sits, it crystallizes and grows. That happens in the body. So then the little tiny veins get clogged. The ones at the toes, the ones at the eyes, the ones at the fingertips. That's why we lose our sight and these problems. So high blood sugar is bad. We want to have normal blood sugar as much as possible. So food raises blood sugar. Insulin lowers blood sugar. An, an analogy that I like to use is what I call the airplane analogy. You're flying an airplane, we'll just say from Los Angeles to New York. Big long flight. That's my day. Flying from LA to New York. My blood sugar is the airplane. It can go up and it can go down. If it goes up, like an airplane, and it gets too high, it'll kill me slowly. I'll get up into the atmosphere and get cold and then die slowly. If it goes to zero fast, just like an airplane, going to zero fast will kill you. So highs will kill you slow, and lows will kill you quick. When I'm flying in the airplane, I look at the altitude, right? And I pull the stick a little bit to adjust, and I push the stick a little bit to adjust. Just like when you're driving a car and you want the car to be straight. You want to stay in a line, so you don't realize it, but you're moving the wheel just a tiny bit, making small adjustments to stay in the line. Not the big turns, but just the staying in the line. So just like a car staying in the line, an airplane is going like this. I eat food and the airplane goes up. I take insulin, the airplane goes down. But in order to go and see my blood sugar, I have to look at my blood. And that becomes a problem that we're going to talk about in a second. This is what it looks like for you the normally sugared people, the normals. After this, my diabetic friends and I will go off and have lunch together. We're going to talk about you. <laughs> we hate you guys. We secretly hate you. Because this is your life. You wake up with a working pancreas, and it's amazing, and you have awesome blood sugar. You eat whatever you want, and you go to sleep with awesome blood sugar. This is what we have to do. We have to listen to our body constantly. Think about what our blood sugar is. Think, think about exercise. I had to think about how far I was going to walk to get here. What I ate for breakfast. I'm having to think about my blood sugar right now so I don't pass out in the middle of this talk. I look at a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. That's the implant that we'll talk about. I then confirm it by pricking my finger. You've seen diabetics prick their finger and look at their blood. And then I count the carbohydrates, and I have to do math every day. And I have to look at the labels that you don't look at on your food, and look at the carbohydrates, and think about that. What, a, what an insidious disease, what a horrible disease, that people who are good at math will live longer. Who would invent a disease like that? If we're going to make a disease, it's going to be amazing. Cancer? No, no, not cancer. Cancer. It's going to be called diabetes. And if you're good at math, you live longer. If you suck at math, freaking dead. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> this is not fair. This is, you think I'm joking. It's literally like that, right? And if you get your calculation wrong, you have a bad day. 
you've had the bad calculation days before. You, you're off by, you know, off by one. Off by one errors are very common, and they mess up my day very badly. Okay, so that circle is called the loop. And what I'm going to share with you today is called looping. How do we close the loop? The loop is eat some food, think about it, do something, take some insulin, check my blood sugar, think about it, take some insulin, and I have to repeat that loop. The loop right now is open. I have to close it by doing the calculations and making the change. When you're driving your non-self-driving car, you're doing all the work. We've done a couple of things like cruise control, right? And some of the fancier cars will like stay away from the car in front of it, but it's not self-driving. It's just kind of laziness because your leg hurts, right? Diabetes is trying to close the loop so we make a self-driving pancreas. I don't want to have to do all this calculations because if I can make a pancreas that works the way your pancreas works, then I will die of old age rather than dying of diabetes. But if we make it cost money, then fewer people will have it. So then we just do it all open source. Open source hardware, open source software, and we make it available to everyone. So then you could potentially save as many people as you want. Okay, computer people. Read and write. This is reading from a file, writing to a file. But what we're going to do is we're going to read where the file is my body. Read what's my blood sugar. Now I have a variable, my blood sugar. And then write. Make it make a change. Do something. Take some insulin. Eat some food. Have some sugar. Whatever. And then do it again. Every few minutes. This is how typically we do these things. We have to go and look at the body. You'll notice that we're actually poking the body to read, and we're poking the body to write. That kind of sucks, because we are just big bags of meat under pressure. <laughs> and if you want to know what's happening in the body, you have to poke it and make it leak, and then look inside of what's going on. There's no way to get insulin into your body without puncturing it, and there's no good way to get information out of the body without puncturing it. So there's a lot of poking in diabetes. It kind of sucks. Now, I've been diabetic for many, many years, so every diabetic engineer always, and I'm looking at my three diabetics because I know that this is true, to get diabetes, and like, ah, oh, this sucks, and spend a week going, man, this sucks. But I'm a programmer, so I'm going to solve this Microsoft Excel. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to write a program, or whatever language you know how to do, Python or .NET or and you're going to make a program that fixes it for you, a mobile app or whatever. There's, oh, you got diabetes? There's an app for that. Solved, right? We want to understand the data. So I did that. I got a Palm Pilot. Some of you don't look like you're old enough to remember what this, what this was. But there was a thing before the internet called the Palm Pilot. It's kind of like an iPad. And it got, one day it got color, which was really cool. And I made a glucose and diabetes management system on the iPad. And I would go and look at my blood sugar in charts and graphs on these tiny devices, and it would help me do the calculations. I was trying to make it so the math wouldn't kill me. And I connected it to a modem, and that sent my blood sugar to the doctor so that he could see my blood sugar as I made the changes. And he could help me so I could travel. When I plugged in the blood sugar meter, though, I found out that the <coughs> protocol to talk to the blood sugar meter was proprietary. I didn't know about proprietary. I was open source, right? I called the blood sugar people and they said, hey, this is great. I'd like to get my data. Notice how I said, my data. I made it. It's my body. Uh, oh, oh, no, you can't have that. You can use our software, but the, the protocol is proprietary. Well, what about the cable? Can I at least get the cable? No, the cable's proprietary. It's a special cable. You have to buy it from us. So what we did is we started breaking into blood sugar meters. We started reverse engineering them to get our data out. This is some code from 2007 that I put up on Microsoft's Coding for Fun, the beginnings of a glucose meter downloader. 
while I was doing that, other people with PhDs were trying to do the same thing and plug in. People were going on Reddit and trying to create systems where they could build Google Sheets that would manage blood sugar. Every diabetic engineer always has some system that they do to manage this. Now, I'm talking about diabetes, but this could apply to blood pressure, heart rate, um, sleep apnea. Everybody's got something. And if you can get data and access to it, then you can make the change. Now, needles suck. Now, all three of my diabetic friends here are, are punk people. Are there any needle people? No? Needles mean manually pump, puncturing yourself each time. So people came up with the idea of making a pump. So now we introduce DIY, your do-it-yourself culture. This is the first insulin pump. Imagine having a disease that sucks so bad that you would wear a backpack pump rather than poke yourself. Now here's the thing, why would I want to poke myself? What's wrong with needles? Needles aren't a big deal, right? I was actually kicked out of a casino once for trying to give myself a shot at the blackjack table. Apparently there's a no bodily fluids rule. I don't know what happened at the casino to have them make a no bodily fluids rule. I don't know if people were bleeding on the board, but they asked me to leave because I pulled the needle out. Sometimes diabetics will quietly, I don't know if you, if you diabetics did this, will go to the bathroom and take your insulin, and take your shot in, in shame. I'm not that diabetic. I'm the one that's like, hang on everybody, before we eat, ah, ah, needles. Is it doing heroin? No, it's insulin, it's okay. That pump was really big. This pump is really small. I want you to look really closely at this. This is a pump that is carved out of a piece of wood by an Italian gentleman. You've got a syringe here and a screw that turns. And the screw turns. What happens when you turn a screw? If you tighten it, it moves in a little bit. So each rotation of the screw is a measurable and reliable movement in, correct? Which would mean that if I take a motor and I spin that screw once, I can push the plunger in a little bit. That's the fundamentals of an insulin pump. So there is insulin inside there, in this tube, going into me. Why would I want this? Why would I want a pager with a tube rather than uh, needles? Well, how many times can you poke yourself with a needle every day before you got tired of it. Any guesses what the number is? Zero. One? <laughs> yeah, see this is the thing. Sometimes people say it's zero. I could never be diabetic. I'm afraid of needles. Well, then you're dead. <laughs> so you're going to get real comfortable with needles. After the 36,000th time that I poked myself with a needle, does it still hurt? You're diabetic for a lot of time. Does it hurt? Every time. Yes. If I punch you in the face twice a day for 30 years, it's not going to stop hurting. It's going to suck every day. So yes, one time is too many for some. Other people, it's 10 times. The nice thing about a pump is that I only have to put it into myself once a week. And then the tube is there all the time. I can actually <coughs> unplug it. There's a port now. Okay. So I can refill it and then move it to another part of my body. Now think about that. Now the pump can make little changes. Imagine the airplane again. How many times are you allowed to touch the stick on the airplane to adjust your altitude? As many times as you want. But with diabetes, you can only eat four or five times a day, right? And you can only check your blood sugar five, six, seven, ten times a day. You can only poke yourself five or six, ten times a day. If you were flying an airplane from LA to New York, and you can only look at the altitude 10 times, and you can only touch the stick 10 times, your flight to New York is gonna kinda of go like that. And that is what a diabetic's blood sugar looks like. But with a pump, it's making a little change every five minutes. That's really interesting. That means that I can potentially do a lot of cool stuff with it. Now, finger sticks so. <laughs> Poking your finger is painful. I got 
very, very painful. Um, but basically, my fingers turned black on both sides for doing that for so many years. So we were looking for what are called non-invasive techniques. Non-invasive means not invading, not poking the meat bag, right? So, so uh, uh, there's this company that made a thing called the Gluco Watch. And it would go and have these pads, these electrical pads, that would go on your wrist, and it would put a little electrical shock on your wrist, and then check your blood sugar by looking at the resistance of the electricity across the two pads. And it would guess what your blood sugar is, not by looking at your blood, but by looking at what's called the interstitial fluid. You know how we're like 70% water? That's why we're so squishy. That plus I don't exercise. Um, <laughs> the squishy parts can tell you whether or not you have a lot of sugar in you. So this Luco watch would go and do that. Unfortunately, it also caused electrical burns. So I, I, I thought it was great, though, because it told me my blood sugar every five minutes. But I called tech support, and I said, hey, love the product, fantastic stuff. The burns, they're a problem. I don't like being burned. And they said, don't worry. Just move the watch on the inside of your wrist. Let the other side heal. And then when that side burns, you have two wrists and four sides. <laughs> so then you would end up chasing burns from arm to arm, inside and out. The Gluca watch is out of business. It is not a simple thing to figure out what your blood sugar is without poking the body. So let's poke the meat bag. This is the system that we use to poke it. It is a needle. Oops. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. That is here, underneath my skin. I have a piece of tape over it, and there's a battery on top. And it's sipping like a straw, the interstitial fluid, and it's Bluetoothing to my phone and telling me what the structure is. In real time. That's my altitude. I don't have to prick my finger more than once a day to calibrate it. It's just like an airplane, you say, what's the altitude? Well, it's zero, we're on the ground. Okay, that's our calibration. And then we'll take off. Okay, we're at 10,000 feet, that's our calibration. And once we know, we can figure out the in-between. Does that make sense? So that's the read. Now I can get that information, but remember when I called before and I said, hey, can I get your cables? Can I get your specifications? That's proprietary. You can't do that. So what we do is we listened in on the Bluetooth signal and broke into that, and we snatch it out of thin air as it jumps out. That sensor, every five minutes, wakes up and goes, hey, here's your blood sugar. Hey, here's your blood sugar. It's not talking to anyone. It's just kind of saying it out to the air. It has a serial number. So we can listen in on that, and we can snatch it out of the air and then send it off to a separate database thereby taking control of our data. This is what it looks like, you couldn't see. This is what a pump looks like. There's a little tube, it's a little plastic tube that pushes the insulin into the fat. Now, if you're a supermodel who does not have diabetes, it looks like this. This person is not diabetic. Ask me how I know. There's no other holes. Diabetics are constantly putting holes in themselves and then healing the other holes. So if this was an actual diabetic, there would be a row of bruises and holes as they were moving these punctures from place to place. We can't just leave the port there forever. We'll use up the tissue. So we're constantly moving it around. Some people take it too far and they plug in all kinds of things. But we can, I just plug in the two. So once I go and I do that, I can store that data in a system. The system that I use is called Night Scout. So I actually have a website on Azure that is backed by this open source nonprofit called Night Scout. And I have a REST API for my body. Okay? Let me switch out of here real quick. Is this microphone on too? Test, test, test. Is this one on? There it is. And that looks unhealthy. Let's 
let's try opening that up again. And we launch the internet. One second.
put it on watch. Now, if I can read blood sugar, if I can see my altitude, how do I tell the pump to do something? This is important. This is not automatic. Sometimes people meet a person with a pump and they go, oh, cool, you got a pump? You don't have to do needles? It just does everything for you, right? No, absolutely not. I have to make all the decisions, 100% myself. But could we potentially turn the read and the right and actually cause the pump to deliver insulin? Modern pumps are locked down and have no way to remotely deliver insulin. But this pump I bought on Craigslist. Do you have Craigslist over here? No. It's like a, like a garage sale, like we buy used things. What is that called? Aukro. What is it? Aukro. Aukro? <laughs> you just go on, you're like, I have an iPhone or whatever, like stolen goods and whatnot. Yeah. So I bought this on, on Craigslist. This is a, a pump from the 90s, before Bluetooth was invented, before Wi-Fi was a thing. And there was a remote control that you could get for this pump that would plug into your keys. So you have your car keys, and you could just go click, click, click. So that if you're having dinner, you can discreetly give yourself uh, insulin. So, some folks broke into that system. It was over 900 megahertz, which is a sub one gigahertz obscure radio frequency band. And they broke into it because there's no <coughs> open standards, it's a completely closed ecosystem, there's no such thing as Bluetooth in this space, and very few pumps allow remote access, so why not break into a pump? And then a woman named Dana Lewis got an idea. She said, if I can see my blood sugar and I can talk to it, I could plug it into a computer with a big battery, carry a Raspberry Pi around in a knapsack, and then I could get a controller to remote control the pump. And then she tweeted in 2015, that's what a closed loop artificial pancreas looks like. Raspberry Pi, battery, insulin pump. This is the transmitter to talk 900 megahertz. She's the godmother of the open source artificial pancreas movement. So this is in 2015. But this is a lot. She, she did this for us, though. She carried it in her, in her fanny pack and walked around for years testing this and using that. But it's a little bit big. So then we plugged in Intel Edison. About that big. But that's a full version of Linux. That's literally running Linux. And then this gentleman, Pete Schwamm, said, Well, I already have a, a pocket supercomputer. Why do I need to carry another operating system around with Wi Fi and screens and stuff? What if I could potentially control it from this? But why can't I control my pump from an iPhone? Why can I not control this pump from the 90s with this phone from last year? Remember what I said? 900 megahertz. 900 megahertz. This thing speaks radio frequency. This thing speaks Bluetooth. So, what do we need? A Bluetooth to radio frequency bridge. This allows me to, on my pump, and actually, let me try something here. This might work. Tomas, could you turn this back on for me and let me get, I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to add my phone. I know, but I want to be connected to your phone. Trust me, this was going to be stupid. Put the password in for me. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go over here. And then I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so bear with me. So I'm on your phone now. So my phone is on your phone, and my computer is on your phone. I'm doing all my app updates because I'm going to use all your data. <laughs> so because we're on the same network now, I'm going to do screen mirroring. And now, over his bandwidth, hopefully on an int runnet, and it's not using too much, that is this phone right here. 
updating is the speed of, I don't know, Telstra or whatever you have there. Okay, so, if you look right there at the bottom, I'm gonna zoom in. It says Riley Link. See how it says 73 dB? child, and Riley Link is named after the child, is just a, it's not a computer, it's just a little microcontroller. Now imagine a future where I could maybe plug it into the back of the phone or make a case of some kind. This is open source software and hardware. You can go and look at the plans. You could, if you have the ability to make chips, you can make this chip yourself. Or you can buy it um, from a, a little small company. Right here, you can see my blood sugar and the loop is now happening every five minutes. Looks at my blood sugar, makes a judgment, thinks about what the right thing to do is, and then does it. So if we look at this, see if this will work on its side. Come on, internet. I don't know why it won't rotate. We, we just all turn our heads over. But that's my blood sugar for 24 hours. The goal is to keep it in that lane. Imagine we're driving, right, or we're flying. The goal is to be as smooth as possible. So while I'm sleeping, even, 3 a.m., it's making adjustments, adjustments that would have ordinarily woken me up. Does that make sense? Pete and the folks in the open source community, hardware and software, were able to go and snatch this protocol off of the thin air and then write Python code to decrypt the bits and control the pump. People call it a security flaw. Someone could theoretically assassinate me remotely with this system wouldn't really assassinate me. They would just give me a really bad day and I would get some orange juice. It would be easier just to stab me. But this has caused the uh, American government and a lot of other governments, as well as ones in Europe, to shut down all insulin pumps with remote access. So I have to go on Craigslist, or what was it called? Open. Oh, I don't know how to say that. Yeah. One of those shady black market places, and I have to buy a 20-year-old a insulin pump with cracks and holes with a specific version of the firmware that still has the vulnerability that allows us to do this. There's a black market for insulin pumps. Welcome to the American healthcare system. Remember when we saw pizza before? That's when you start thinking about food. Is it short, medium, or long-term? Food is it food that is going to be digested quickly, or is it going to food that's going to stick around? I can actually go and dose now from my watch. We've got papers that explain the whole thing. I'm going to I'm running out of time, so the goal here is to die of old age. All of this is open source and free. The website is written in D3JS and Node and runs on Azure or Heroku. It's called Night Scout. The app on the iPhone is called Loop. <coughs> the open source artificial pancreas that Dana Lewis created is in Python and Go and is runs on Linux. And if you want, you could make your own with just off the shelf carts and a Raspberry Pi if you wanted to. It can make these go away. That's diabetes right there. This was actually me giving a talk before I had this system, and that was the stress release 
of the sugar being dumped into my body. Right now, though, my blood sugar on, this is my actual blood report from the doctor, indicates that I am non-diabetic. Now, I am diabetic. But this system that I have to keep charged every night and deal with, I've been, I've been now looping, there's about 7,000 people looping. I'm looper number six. I've been looping now for over three years. This thing runs 24-7. This phone is always on at my nightstand for the last uh, several years, and it's got my blood sugar at non-diabetic levels. I still have to go through uh, security uh, at the airport with this. What's the word for pump in the check? Pumpa. Okay. In um, in Spanish, it's bomba. <laughs> Which, if you speak Spanish, is una problem. Because if you walk through security like this, oh, it's una bomba. It's una bomba de insulina. You know, you're like like this. You know. And then also, I happen to be someone that carries around like a Raspberry Pi. So don't go to the airport like it's una bomba de <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe that, uh, that being an old white guy is, gives you some privilege, the fact that I've made it through security in 10 countries with this and no one has said a word to me uh, is proof that, uh, that I don't have to worry about anything. So the way forward, my data is a right. I've written about this on my blog extensively. You can go and check it out. Tidepool Loop is the looping application, open source. The Night Scout is the website and open APS. Everything that is being done is on GitHub. And the exciting part about this is when you send a kid, it's not my kid, to school, and you can remotely look at your kid's blood sugar from the watch and see that the kid is okay. Or a school nurse that had multiple diabetic kids inside the school could have a dashboard. Or there's a bicycle group called Team Type 1. They're all type 1 diabetics that are professional bicyclists. And there's a dashboard where they can monitor 30 people and their blood sugar, and the doctors can watch them run the race all in real time. I even went up to Xbox, and I had them create a implanted system so a diabetic kid could have their Xbox avatar have the diabetes plug-in. These are the hashtags. Let's eat some uh, sandwiches and then we'll talk about .NET. Cool? Thank you.
You ready to get started? Is that cool? All right, cool. Thanks for sticking around. I realize that it's a long, a long day on a random Wednesday afternoon. Did you tell your boss that you were working from home? <laughs> are they calling this training, or how do you? How are you here? Do they know that you're. You just say Scott Hanselman. Is that a go. standard check lunch? It's just. Like four hours long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are the free to Are you like in the bathroom right now? <laughs> cool. cool. All right. So um, this is going to be about .NET and open source. Is that cool? Are there any people here who are not .NET people? Maybe like a, a spy from the Ruby community, <laughs> a node person that didn't really want to come. The Java. Java crowd. You can't win them all. <laughs> I did Java. I did Java at Nike. 1997. Oh, yeah. What is 1997 like? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was doing. I did, I did Java for many years. I did RMI and the uh, early days of Java. Yeah. Cool. So this will be good for from a Java perspective because what I want to talk about is kind of like the runtime context around you know, like Java uses bytecode and .NET uses IL. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Any any other non .NET people here who would be not be familiar with .NET? Don't care. Most of you are .NET people, then. Okay. Um, how many people here are doing .NET Core now today? Okay. How many people are not doing it? Maybe your boss doesn't understand, and doesn't love you. You're not doing .NET Core. Why, Ross? Uh, is Ross here? Because of the um, application is old. You have a really old application. Yeah, yeah. Is old. it like Windows forms? Uh, WCF and WCF, yeah. Uh, WPF. WPF. WPF, we can do WCF as a challenge. We do have a client for that, though. We'll talk about that. Cool. Um, so, um, are there any .NET people who got into .NET in the last year or two? Maybe you came from something else. You're, you're fresh. And fresh out of school or fresh out of fresh, fresh out of school? Fresh out of school. No, I'm not out yet. Okay. You're not. You're in school. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. College, high school. No, no, no. Just the, uh, what's the, basically like class. Okay. Private, like, and yeah, and you have all like students together? All of those. Students. This is like a student <laughs> room? Yeah, my student. <laughs> <laughs> you add their ages up together, it's 30. <laughs> <laughs> Entire row. Okay, cool. So let's do this. We'll talk about some historical things because I think that in school, mm -hmm. I don't know what you all learn in school, but sometimes I think that uh, young people who learn, um, Young people don't learn the full stack. Like you all tell yourselves that you're full stack developers, but you have to ask, like, how far down do you go? Mm -hmm. Did you go down to, did you, did you do assembly language in school? Do you know what that is? You did. But you're old, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a funny, a funny thing you can do to find out how low level someone is. It's a great interview question. If you say, um, you go to the browser, you type google.com, you hit enter, tell me what happens, All right? Someone might say, well, the, the client makes an HTTP call to the server. Someone else might say, well, there's a DNS lookup, and the DNS lookup, and you know, then the port is open, and TCP, the, someone else, an interviewer, an interview that I had, they said, well, the, the key metal and press the enter at the enter key. <laughs> then, like an electron jumps, you know, and they were telling me about like the quantum realm where Ant-Man lives. And, and, they, and, and the whole interview, they never got out of the keyboard. <laughs> so excited about that, like how low level do you go? So I think sometimes about that people don't really like think about that. Even node folks or JavaScript folks, you know, you'll tell a, a, a person a younger person, like, yeah, we'll open up Chrome, and then they'll say, they'll press F12, and they open up developer tools. Well, look at that. Low level. Low level. Like, you're in a JavaScript virtual machine, in a user mode process, in a virtual machine that's running Windows itself. You're like nine levels from the metal. But it also brings up an interesting thing that older people like myself learn on the metal <coughs> up. And younger people usually learn from the glass of the monitor back. So young people, old people like Hello World, console app. 
which has nothing to do with the web or JavaScript <coughs> or anything interesting at all. And then younger people will make a website and React or something, and they just don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But I think it's fun if you imagine there's like this mountain, and the old people are on one side, and the young people on the other side. Kind of make a tunnel through the mountain and find some common ground. Because you don't want to be a gatekeeper. You know what a gatekeeper is? Someone said, well, you're not, you're not a real programmer. You know? That's like saying you're not a real driver if you don't know how to drive a stick shift. Right? Because there's young people now that take only public transportation or they take only Uber. And they don't really care about the car. My father made me learn how to drive a manual shift, shift car. Because in America, many, many, many cars are automatic. And he believed that um, someday there would be an emergency. Maybe someone would break their leg, and I would have to drive them to the hospital. Oh my god, he broke his leg. Let me get, oh, that's a manual stick. You're dead. I can't, I can't drive you to the hospital because I don't know how to use a clutch in the car, right? And I think sometimes older people in programming will say, well, you're not a real programmer because you don't know about the assembly line and chain kernels and stuff like that. But it's sometimes fun to look at those things. So here's what I thought we would spend a little time doing to remind ourselves about .NET. Let's see if this microphone will work. Does that work OK? You can hear me still? No? Yes, no? Yes. Maybe you can turn me up. All right. And then who's using the Windows terminal? Do you know about the new Windows terminal? No? Really? Who just learned that the Windows terminal was a thing and has never heard that word before today? What about, what about WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux? Oh, oh this is beautiful. All right, kids. We'll do some stuff. Let's, let's. All right, let's do this. A couple things here. Okay, first, if I'm in Windows, and don't tease me about my desktop, I know, I know where everything is, all right? Can't, can't blame me. If I go and run, command.exe. This is like DOS, but not DOS. Right? It's not really DOS. It's, it's a lie. But this thing here, the thing that drew that box, that shell, is different from this part. Do you know the difference between a shell and a terminal? What is the difference, sir? Quiz. This is how he, we're going to see if he gets the job or not. A shell and a terminal. What's the name? Some shells. Bash. Bash. PowerShell. PowerShell. Not really DOS. Fake DOS. I don't command. Um, ZSH. So, fish. So the terminal is only application that allows you to interact with the shell. The, exactly. Very well said. He said the terminal is the application that lets you interact with the shell. I read your blog. <laughs> His boss is listening. Did you read? He wasn't actually paying attention. He just he Googled it and added cancel it. And he found it. I wrote a blog post on this. So the thing that listens at the prompt, that's the shell. The thing that painted on the screen is the terminal. It's very important. Because if I go and I run our shell, a different shell. Or I run bash, a different shell. The same program drew all three of those things. This Chrome, what they call the Chrome, the, the frame, was drawn by a thing called conhost, the console host. And these shells take input and return strings and stuff, but the painting itself is done by the old console, the old Windows console from 30 years ago. And you can know it's super old because you can go into this dialog box. And some of us are so old, we remember a time when there were only like three choices for fonts, and we didn't have true type fonts here. Now, this console sucks. Horrible. It's old and crusty and everyone hates it. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. It's also really slow. Here's a fun fact. If you do this, let's pretend that I'm doing a build and this is my logs. Did you know that the smaller this is, the faster it goes? 
<laughs> you know what the fastest way to make things work is you just go like this. It's going like 10 times faster right now. Because the, the old Windows terminal synchronously paints and does stuff. It can't continue doing work while it's also painting. So it literally can only go as fast as it can output stuff. It can't skip frames. For all I know, this could be done already, and we're just waiting for the catch up. Okay? So that's a huge problem. That's one of the reasons that it sucks. It also doesn't have tabs. It's not very pretty. There's a bunch of reasons that this sucks. So we wrote a new terminal called the Windows Terminal. It's open source and it's yummy. You can go and get it at the Windows Store. It's free, just type terminal. And it'll automatically detect what you have on your machine. So it detected that I have PowerShell, fake DOS. I can modify it and I added additional things here. I also have these Linuxes, multiple Linuxes. Those settings can be changed here, and they're just a JSON file. Because the kids love JSON. I would make it XML. I don't see everyone thinks XML is gross. All we did was change these from angle brackets to curly braces, and you all just think it's great. Same thing. So here, that's kind of true. Here I've got my cursor shape, my font, my font size. I can change all of these things and make it look as pretty as I want. In fact, how pretty can I make it? I can go out here and Google with Bing for... I always add Hanselman when I Google for anything. You should do that too. You should make a browser thing just to search only my blog. So this is a thing I made that is basically reaction GIFs when I'm running a test. If I'm running like some tech, if I'm running an app and it fails, I get a reaction GIF, and then if it builds and it succeeds, then I get a better reaction GIF. So the whole background is completely adjustable in the Windows terminal. It's awesome. Plus, I can control scroll, which is pretty sweet. That's a good enough reason to, to actually upgrade right there. And if we go here, so there is, this is called power line. See how we have glyphs? inside of here showing me my git branch. And this is totally customizable. This is not the Windows terminal. What the Windows terminal did is it supports better fonts now. So if I run the old bash, see how sad this is? It's because those fonts are missing and the terminal doesn't know how to paint them, okay? But it does over here, all right? It looks way better. Additionally, if I go somewhere that has, there you go, changes. So here I've got an addition that I need to go. That's called posh yes. And there's a thing called Oh My Posh. Posh is like what we call PowerShell. And I've got all of this stuff on my blog. But what's significant about this is you can plug any shell in that makes you happy. I plugged in Mono. I plugged in Anaconda for Python work. And I can go and actually re-adjust and reorder these tabs and make it however I want. So you can make it yourself the way you want. You can go full screen. It's lovely. Now, it's worth pointing out WSL. Remember I asked before, does anyone know what WSL is? Where are my WSL people at? Okay. 
couple of folks here. Do you know that Windows 10 now runs Linux? You know that we're actually shipping a Linux kernel with Windows. This isn't fake Linux. It's not Sigwin. Have you heard of Sigwin? C Y G W I N. That's not Linux. That's the GNU utilities that are portable C code recompiled in Windows. So when you type DIR, it does a directory calling Windows APIs. Right? You type LS, it does Windows APIs. It looks at those things. And what WSL is, is it allows you to run what are called the user mode ELF binaries. You know about the user mode versus the kernel. Let's talk about that for a second. Actually, do I have, this might be a perfect time to pull out the Surface Pen that I never use for anything and see if it works today. <clears throat> because I probably have never um, charged the battery. It's going to call a Linux API, what's called a sys call, a system call. There's a whole table of them, a list of all the APIs that Linux kernel can handle. But Windows doesn't have any of that stuff, right? So WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, came out and it said, if I see anybody calling Linux APIs, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to redirect it. So I could go and run a Linux process and then if someone called in looking for a kernel we would redirect it and say Windows will handle it for you. We we're going to actually lie to Linux. Okay? So what I could do is go out to the command line here and say WSL list you can see that I've got three Linuxes installed. This one here, WLinux, is on version one of WSL. So I'm going to say WSL D, this is distribution, WLinux. And I'll just run something like HTOP. So I'm running now a Linux thing. See how fast that was? There wasn't any spin up, it just it ran. Now I'm going to open up Task Manager. And let's look for that. Well, that's not helpful. Let's try this again. And there's HTOP right there. So the Linux process is visible on Windows, which is very blurry. It blurs the line. Like, what's going on there, right? Is it really a Linux process? Is it really a Windows process? It's actually called a Pico process, a tiny process. And it's, we're lying to it. We, we are running it as a Windows process, but it's actually calling into, into Linux, and that's called WSL1. WSL2, over here, if I run HTOP, is the latest version of WSL. And it's hiding inside of this. And we actually ship an actual Linux kernel. Microsoft has forked the Linux kernel, has their own distribution of it, ships it with Windows, and it's the full literal Linux kernel. But I didn't fire up a virtual machine. We've all spun up 
a virtual machine before. It takes like 30 seconds and you have to fire up Hyper-V or virtual box or whatever. It's blah, virtual machine. And it doesn't feel integrated with Windows, right? It, it feels, feels like, like another, another computer on your machine. And that's, that's not the experience that we want people to have. If I come back out here, and let's make a, let's see here, so we're, I'm in home stock, let's make a text file, vim, this is prod.txt, this is text file, from Linux. I just, I just have to shut the computer, computer down, right? Because I don't know how to get out of there. <laughs> okay. So there's the text file. How would I get that from my Linux machine to my Windows machine if it was a virtual machine? I'd have to SSH in or S copy. It would again, it would feel like another computer. And that's not a good experience. Virtual machines are no fun. So I'm just going to type Explorer, and I'm going to run a Windows app from Linux, <coughs> and then open it in Notepad. Even better, what if I just went and ran Notepad? How disturbing is that? Notice the part down there where it says LF. Notepad handles that. And that's the actual text file. But when we run Explorer, the way that we are making those things work is by having an, an internal network. So I can just copy files back and forth, which is really, really cool. So why would anyone care about this, right? So, are there Mac people here? Most Mac people use Mac because they like Bash, they like iTerm, they like the feeling of the, the hardware. But there's been some issues with Mac lately, uh, the keyboard particularly, and there's, there's a moment where we could get people to try Windows again. Um, and what are the things that say about Windows? Well, it doesn't run Linux. That's a thing. It doesn't run Bash. It doesn't let me run whatever I want. If I want to run Ruby on Rails or Java or a bunch of things, as a Windows developer, you've probably Googled for something before and you've gone to a website and you say, here are the instructions on how to set up Redis or whatever. And it says, okay, I'm just looking for the instructions. And then you see a dollar sign. You go, oh, this is not for me. Right, you've, you've come into someone's house and you see the dollar sign and you're like, I don't have a dollar sign. Mine says C colon backslash. Where are those instructions? And then you, you're dead. You have nothing to do. So with Windows actually running Linux, I can just go sudo apt update and install Redis or whatever makes me happy, run Docker, I can do anything. But you might argue, well, you could do that before on Windows just by running a virtual machine, right? This is a lightweight virtual machine. It's got about 50 megs. I can literally just go from nothing to fire up the terminal. One 1,000. About one second startup. Runs all the Linux stuff. Here's where it gets interesting, though. Let's say I install .NET on it. I install .NET by running apt. And I'll say uh, make directory rework empty folder .NET new console. Got a console app. I think we're still tethered to your phone, so it's probably, there you go. It just got that stuff. So there's the, the app. How would I then do my development work on this? I can compile it. I can say .NET run, and it'll say hello world. I could run Vim, and then I could change that. 
if I knew how to move around in Venom, I'm already lost. I don't even know how you all live in this world. <laughs> but that's not a super awesome feeling. What if I could run code from Linux on Windows, launch Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code splits in two. Splits in two. Half of it runs on Linux as a server. VS Code server. Half of it runs on Windows. Right now, it's downloading the stuff that I need over this gentleman's Find data. And again, I apologize. He's only got six days before it rolls over. We got to get that data used up before we leave here today. This will take a second to uh, download that because it's been an update. If it was not tethered, it would come down a lot faster. And when I open up this program, the syntax highlighting. There you go. We just downloaded that. Let me get the debugger now. The syntax highlighting happened on the server. Where is the server? The server is remote. Look at this. These are the local extensions. These extensions are inside of Linux. I don't even have, for example, Ruby installed on Windows. I don't have any Java stuff installed on Windows. I can just go here install it in that, that special workspace. So for example, if our Java friend gave me some Java stuff, I would put it on the Linux side, because it's easier to set up Java there, and get all the dependencies and all the native stuff. I would then open it up, Visual Studio Code would say, oh, this is Java, it would install the correct extensions. Or if he wanted, he could have an extensions.json file that would recommend extensions for me, his coworker. He would install those inside this separate place. It's almost like it's a container. And half of the work happens in there. And I don't have to install anything on the Windows side. When the, this will be done in just a moment. And when I type console, I don't think it's, I think it's funny. Some of you all are giggling because uh, 100 megabytes takes a while to download over a phone. It would not take much time. Uh, anywhere else. There you go. Done. Okay. So now, when I say console and I hit dot, that moment, that IntelliSense, was actually a little call from Windows into Linux. And if we go and look at Linux and run HTOP, You can see all the stuff that's happening all in the background. It's just making processes and doing all kinds of stuff. And there it is. The VS Code server. This is really significant. This is not about .NET. This is about like the future of software development. Right? Think about how you get set up at work right now. You go and you get clone a bunch of stuff, you install a bunch of stuff, you NPM install a bunch of things, you prep your machine. And if you work on multiple projects, you might have it in containers, you might have it in virtual machines, you might have it in different folders, you might have different versions of stuff. What if you could have all of these things be completely separate in development containers? where the container has the SDK that you want, and then Visual Studio Code is headless. And it's really kind of a dumb terminal in this client-server experience. Then you would just get the thing, from, you know, clone the repo, open it up, and it would just work. So for example, let's see if this works. I think I've got on Git, uh, my GitHub folder. There you go. Here's some Rust. I don't know if this will work or not. It might not work. Uh, this is some Rust code. I don't think I have Rust installed. I do not. I'll hit code dot. 
Visual Studio Code is going to start up and says, hey, this folder has a development container. Do you want to open that as a container? So look what it's doing. It's actually talking to Docker, and it's getting the stuff I need to be a Rust developer on a machine that doesn't have Rust, or doesn't have Java, or doesn't have whatever. It'll build this once. Here it just said installing VS Code container, VS Code server, rather. So it's installed VS Code server on that thing. Now it's installing the Rust extensions. This works for anything. Now look, here's Rust. See how the syntax highlighting just showed up? And now I've got a Rust environment, literally like that. Did not have one five minutes before. So step one was that separation between Linux and Windows, a kind of a partnership. I could easily move between the two. Step two was moving to containers. What do you think step three is? What's the next obvious thing? Running it in the cloud. Right? The, the, like literally the entire development environment will run in the cloud. You know how we always complain about how our laptops are too slow for real development, but we want laptops so we can you know, not be at work. But then we want like big, powerful laptops that can be super strong so they can do the build. But then we really like Chromebooks because they're really cute and they're light and they last forever. What if I could run Visual Studio Code, but the work happened on some 8 processor or 16 processor machine that runs in the cloud that only charges me by the minute rather than by the hour. If I spin it up and I do its thing and it goes away. So that's where we think development is going. The, the ability to have these self-contained environments where you can get this work done really, really effectively, even doing interactive debugging. We go, uh, by the way, I want to point out down here, it says Dev Container Rust. If I click on that, look at some of the choices that we've got for remote. I can forward ports out of the container so I can make it look like it's local host. We go back over to Ubuntu and run code again. I want to point out how seamlessly and easily we're moving between these things. I want to point out when I say file, open file, what file system is that? That's Ubuntu. And if I want the Windows file system, I just hit show, show local. And then I get that dialog box. Which, Which is interesting, because you know what else I could do? I could go and I could do this over SSH. So you might have a powerful machine at home or at work, and you want to use Azure, you want to use AWS. You can go install this stuff in your own thing, and then open a file system up with AWS. And I think it starts getting really, really interesting. In the future, I predict that people won't even think about these things. It'll just work. It'll just show up for work, and you'll open the dev container, and you'll do your thing. And everything there is open source and works wonderfully, and you don't have to think about it. But isn't it nice and interesting to learn about what's underneath? Because you probably already knew about containers, generally. You probably already knew that Linux was a thing. You probably already knew that Windows was a thing. But you probably didn't think about squishing all three of them together in such an unusual and creative way. But once you do that, you can start doing other weird stuff. Another example of a kind of a cool, weird thing that you can do before I get into some low-level .NET. If I go to shell.azure.com in my browser, and then I'm going to go and uh, probably log in as myself. And it immediately is giving me a cloud shell. So rather than SSHing into a machine or shushing into this machine. 
uh, I'm going to get a terminal. I can get Bash or PowerShell inside of the inside the browser here, and this will be a real Linux machine in the cloud. Right? On top, on top, do whatever. I've got. Python and .NET already installed, and then the interesting part about it is that we've got this cloud drive, right? I've actually got a .NET application sitting right there in the cloud. And that's in the browser, which is interesting, but what if it was here? Just as another tab. What if I could just go Azure Cloud Shell? It goes in my quest and instance. You see how it's kind of black and white, not black and white, uh, transparent. I have a different style with this particular, um, this particular terminal. It's going to go and grab a shell instance, and this is all free. If you have an Azure account, the cloud shell compute is all entirely free. And then I can move between Ubuntu locally, PowerShell locally, or uh, a terminal in the, in the cloud here. And this will just take a second to fire up that terminal. That terminal is, in fact, a container that's running in Azure, and I've just remoted into it. Does that make sense? Boom. So there I am, and there's my cloud drive. Same cloud drive as before. In this case here, I'm in a different account. There's my Python app. I could go and run Vim, and again, I'm sitting inside of the Windows terminal. So then you have, then it really, uh, edit anyway. There you go. Then it really blurs the line between a terminal and a shell and the process that runs the shell. Where is that thing? Is it, is it remote? Is it here? Is it in Windows? Is it in Linux? It even gets more mind twisty if you think about things like PowerShell Core, which runs on Linux and it's a shell. But it's also a batch processor. Okay? So what if I were here? In, uh, let's, uh, let's open up fake, fake DOS. DOS. <laughs> here, here I'm in DOS, DOS and I type DIR, and that makes a string, right? right? You, know you know that you can pipe things, things right? right? You, know you know what I just did right there? The board. Yeah, yeah I just piped the result of the DIR to the clipboard. Some, Some of you have been here for like, like two or three hours, hours and you haven't gotten any useful tips at all, but you're too polite to leave. And then you just saw that. And you're like, well, I don't know what the hell he's been talking about, but I can use that clipboard trick right now. That's useful. The rest of this was nonsense. I don't know what that was, an hour about diabetes and then shells. But I can take that to the bank right now. I can immediately go and charge people by the hour for that tip right there. Can you read from the board? Can you read from the clipboard? I don't know. That's a good question. You ask for too much. We don't have the technology, man. Place a copy of the tab. I don't know if you can read from the clipboard. In PowerShell, you can do that. Really? Oh, okay. Let's do that. What is it? Get clipboard? Yeah, and right there. You sure? But not, not in core. Not, not in core? core. That's scandalous. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's really not work yet. There it is. Thank you, sir. Look at that. So, here's an interesting thing, though. You also learned something. Right, thank you for teaching me that. Now, what if I did this, though? What if I said this? I don't know if I have anything in there. What do I have in my DIR? What just happened there? We just took the output from a directory in fake DOS and piped it into a virtual world running Linux and ran grep on it. Now, this is where things get yeah, shivered. I just want to point out the gentleman in the front just went like that. Which is the, it's the technological equivalent. Why would you want to do that? But this is the thing. We don't know why yet. We just know it's awesome. And someone will find a way or a reason, right? Why would you want to do that? Well, with SIGWIN, as we mentioned before, that's GNU utilities that have been compiled to Win32. You're getting a version of GREP compiled for Windows. 
In this one, you've got the real world. If you were doing a large hybrid system, most systems, <coughs> young, looking at the young people in the third row, you're going to find art, like we're a .NET shop. No, you're not. This is a .NET department, and this department does Java, and these folks do Redis, and they all talk together. And it's a hassle to get those things to build and test. But if you can run a half dozen Linuxes and Windows and PowerShell and PowerShell Core on one machine, you can orchestrate large cross-system builds and tests across containers, the cloud, Linux, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes you're going to want to go and pipe something across universes like that, and have the resulting pipe pipe then into the clipboard. Right? It's, it's up to you on how you want to do those things. That, that starts getting really, really interesting, in my opinion. These, These are, are all, in fact, by the way, different, different here's my blood sugar, sugar. Uh, uh, different, different Linuxes. Linuxes. Right, that's 1604. That's 1804. And I think W Linux is like some Debian. I don't know. I don't know. How do you ask Debian what it is? You don't know? What? What? Uname? That's not helpful. <laughs> there you go. Super Linux. I don't know what it is, but it's uh, it's something Linuxy. Yeah. This is called W Linux. I can actually go to the store, search for Linux. Over his phone. <laughs> he doesn't know I'm downloading Halo with this data because I'm on a metered plan. And I can search for Linux and I can download like six or seven different Linuxes. The coolest part is that you can actually make your own Linux distro because we've open sourced the distro builder. So if you at your company have a specific version, of Linux that you want to use. We've actually got an open source sample to build your own distribution so your company's Linux could be in your store. And this is just the Surface book. I mean, I'm not doing anything fancy here. Why I think that this is an interesting and compelling world to spend time in outside of a Mac is that Linux on the Mac is really you know, called, called Darwin, Darwin and, it's and it's a BSD flavor that's not, not truly like Ubuntu or Linux or Alpine. When, when in fact, fact, I could go over here in the, the, the Microsoft Store and download, download Alpine right now and run that. So I just hit install and in a second that's going to show up as another Linux that I can run from the command line. Isn't that cool? So this is kind of a reminder of some of the stuff that you can do. Now, where were we? We were doing something with .NET, if I recall, probably on the desktop, and I called it WeWork, or no, I was doing it from Linux. Let's go back and do it from the desktop. Say .NET New. When I say .NET New, I get a list of all of the stuff that I could potentially new up or run. These are all things that I could run. I can make WPF apps and console apps. Doing it at the command line is the command line equivalent of going to Visual Studio and saying file new project. Right? It's just the command line version of that. So it's the same thing you can do in Visual Studio. The folks that were students, you're learning C Sharp in what world? In Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code? Visual Studio proper. Grandfather, grandfather Visual Studio. Right. Right. <laughs> and do you like do interactive debugging and you just like you say file new project and hit F5 and you write your code and you don't think about it? No, we use debugger. You do the bug debugger. Do you ever like look at the DLLs and look in the bin debug folder? I don't. Okay, let's do it. So let's go here. I'm going to say .NET new console. That's file new project. Okay. And, and then I'm going to go and look, look in the folder and see what got made. Now I'm using .NET Core 3.1. So if I say dot, .NET, actually let me do this. If I say .NET run, 
one, one one thousand, two, two one thousand, three, three, three seconds. seconds. That's kind of long. This, this is the part, part where you go, ah, darn, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and then you like, go to Java, right? <laughs> one, one thousand, two, that's, that's too slow, slow right? right? Let's, go, Let's look go look in the bin folder, folder debug, debug net core app, app, and I, I see that there's a WeWork exe in that, in that folder. Let's, Let's run, run that, that instead. instead. That was not two seconds. Now, now let's do it at scale. scale. <laughs> that's, a, that's a benchmark. I call that a micro benchmark. Well, so why was it fast there? It was fast there because .NET Run is a restore of the packages and a build and an emit. It gets you, you know, emits the executable. It writes it out to disk, and then it runs it. So .NET Run is not something you do in production. .NET Run is something that you do as a developer, right? Now let's do this. Let's change the application. I'm going to type. I'm going to go here to the command line. I'm going to type push d. Anyone know what push d does? And then I'm going to go back up a couple of folders. I'm going to change program.cs. And I'm going to add a console.read line so that app will stick around when I run it. And I'm going to type pop D. Now, now I'm back, back down here. here. I push, push the directory onto the stack, and then I pop it off the stack. You see, you see I, have I have some painting trouble, trouble here. You see, you see how I, I keep clearing? I was working on a new prompt, and I was trying to do right aligning, where I want the, the time on the right. But you can see that when it wraps, it doesn't really work. And then it resets the right align. So that's why I keep doing that. Sorry. All right, All right, let's, let's run, run WeWork. WeWork. Oh, oh, did I, did I not run? I didn't actually uh, build the thing. Dot dot net build. build. Is everybody, everybody having fun watching, watching the show? No. Excellent. Everybody. I think I'm thinking about the gentleman to our right. Um, so here, so here I'm, I'm running this application. application. And uh, uh, it's, it's waiting. waiting. It's, it's sitting, sitting at console dot read line. So I can go and run Process Explorer, which is like better task manager, and find our app. Where is our app? What do you name it? We work. Check it out. You can see the tree, how the terminal called the shell, WSL, uh, the shell then rather called WeWork. And then inside it, I can see the .NET stuff and I can see the Windows stuff. This is a really important reminder. When we said console.write on it, who actually like, called the operating system? Did .NET call? into a thing that printed the string out? Think about the responsibilities. Just like assert your assumptions. .NET's job was make a string that said hello world. And then it called a function called console.writeLine that it then handed into Windows. And then Windows handed into the terminal that painted the thing. And if you look here, you see the .NET stuff and then the Windows internal stuff. If I were to run the same application on Linux, would this be the same? Yeah. And what would happen here? It's in Linux binaries. Linux -y stuff. Exactly. If I go back here to fake DOS and I say where dot net what's it saying? It's actually, it's actually telling you where, where it is. Where, where is it? It's in C program files dot net. Right? right? We, go we go over to Ubuntu. We, we say which dot net. It's in user bin. bin. So, so it's got its own world. It's its own version of dot net. In fact, this is dot net 2.1. And this is dot net. 
3.1 point to change, right? So there are two different machines here because there's two different file systems. But if I went over here in .NET and I ran it in the command line in Ubuntu, the responsibilities would be different. So then that starts getting you thinking about like what is, is .NET itself at its core. Let's go here, and I want to run a thing. Actually, let's do this. I just realized something. What's that? Any ideas, students? What's the difference between that and that? Yes, I'm not asking you. When I ask questions like this, I'm asking you to guess because you probably know it. You just tend to puzzle it out. I'm not asking that. It's a trivia question. So one is a library, one is an executable, right? So the red one you can run, that is true. Let's see this. Let me delete the executable. Let's actually just delete it. It's gone. Can I still run the app? So what was the executable? It's the wrapper? It was a lie. He called it a wrapper. It was a wrapper. That WeWork.exe was really just .net.exe with a little bit of spice. Why would that be necessary? Because it's more intuitive when you write an application for the executable to pop out with the name. Back in the old days in Java, you used to have to type Java foo.jar. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen things like Minecraft that make it an executable that does that work for you because it makes people feel better. You still haven't made that stand. It's 2019. <laughs> it's the last month of the decade. <laughs> but see, those are like little usability things, right? That, that in fact, is the, the DLL there. So we work .dll. So let's do this. Let's, let's run, run an app called IL Spy, Intermediate, Intermediate Language Spy. What's that? It was written by a chick. Written by a chick? Yeah. All the good stuff was. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not pandering. Um, and let's look at this. How do we make the font bigger? There we go. Look at that. So when you compile C Sharp, a lot of you know this already, it turns into an intermediate language. It doesn't turn into a language that is computer specific. This is super important. Because if you write an application, he's got an Intel ThinkPad something, i7. I don't know when it was made. I've got an i something. But let's say that his was made in 2013 and mine was made in 2018. Even though they're both i7, they have different instruction sets available. He might have a desktop class processor, and I might have a laptop class, right? He might have hyper-threading, and I might not. There's differences between these machines. So if I compile code, and I need it to run as fast as possible, there's a couple of choices. I can say, I'm going to compile it for a specific Intel processor made in a specific year, and I'm going to optimize the hell out of it so it runs amazing on ThinkPads. But then I have to know that ThinkPads exist. I have to know all about them. I have to optimize my stuff so that it'll run only on a ThinkPad. Ugh. Right? But then it'll run, yeah, maybe not at all, or poorly on another machine. Or, what if we just pre-chew our food. If we have apples, we chew it, we chew it and make applesauce. It's not apple juice quite yet. That is the applesauce of C Sharp. It's pre-chewed into an intermediate or middle language that is halfway between C Sharp and low-level code that would run an Intel process. And then we ship the intermediate language onto his machine or his machine or her machine, and I put it on Linux or Windows or x86 or x64 or i7 or Celeron, whatever. And then what do we do? We let the end user's machine go the last, we call it the last mile. It does what's called jitting, just in time. 
just in time to run. And jitting isn't, people just take it for granted. Like, why does jitting exist? Why is it a thing? Why does it happen? It happens so that it can run as fast as possible on this machine, which is different from my machine. And I don't know anything about the machine until I actually get there. Isn't that interesting? There's three ways that I can take intermediate language and run it on a machine. I can do what's called AOT, ahead of time compilation, where I just get it all the way down to the lowest level. You know, basic code of the Intel processor. I target the, I target the operating system. I target the processor, stepping level, everything, ahead of time. There's just in time, where I compile each function as I hit it the first time. Or what's the third one? Both together. Interpreted. You take the abstract syntax tree and you just, at runtime, look at it. A good example would be a for loop. An interpreter has a for loop that it has to go and do like 10 times. And the first time it does it and it looks at each line and it comes around for the second loop. And it's like it's never seen it before, and it does it slowly each time because it doesn't know what could have changed. But a just-in-time compiler sees that loop the first time, optimizes it into native code, and then runs it at full speed. And that is why the modern C-sharp jitter is almost as fast as C. And that's not a, that's a fact. It's a computer science fact. The benchmarks are you can write native Java, native C, native code that runs damn near or f as fast or faster. You can also do hybrid or multi-staged jitting because jitting takes time. If I have a function that does some work and it gets hit, I have to stop, compile code, and then run it. You see? And if I do that, it's going to take a second. If you have a giant app, some of you were saying you worked on old, you worked on an old app. Does it take a long time to start up? Oh yeah. How long? Like 10, 20 seconds? If, even a minute. Even a minute. So he's got an app. So what's happening during that time? It's compiling. And here's why that sucks. It's compiling on that machine every single time he runs the app. And that's really annoying. And what we can also do, though, is we want to say to ourselves, well, do we optimize for startup? Like, could we get that minute down to 10 seconds? That'd be cool. You would love that. But what if I told you I could make it startup faster, but it would now run 20% slower once it started? So then you have to go and pick, well, do I start fast or do I stay fast? And you'd probably say, well, I'll pay the upfront cost for the the sustained throughput speed. We can do now multi-level jitting, which means we do a quick pass to start up fast. And then while it's running, we're also compiling in the background and we're testing. A, we're literally doing runtime A-B testing. And if we determine that we compile it faster over here, we swap the function out with the faster version and you get the benefits of both. You can also do what's called NGEN, if you've done NGEN before. You can try this at work. NGEN is one-time local compilation of your application and you put it on the computer, or the machine that you, and then it starts up fast. We're going to call that in .NET um, 3.1, ready to run. So you get it on the machine and at the end of the installer, you make the ready to run image. And you do that last moment. You take this and compile it at the last second. The next version of .NET, .NET 5, will also support the native compilation. So here's an interesting thing, though. If I go over to Mono, which is a different .NET, totally different open source .NET, I can actually run Mono WeWork, and I just run my .NET Core application with, with an entirely different runtime. You can also do the same thing with .NET code where we can compile it to JavaScript and then run .NET in the browser. You've seen that, it's called Blazor, right? 
So, so for example, example here's an application that is a web application that uses all the kinds of single page app or spa type modern React Angular type things, except there's not a line of JavaScript in the entire application because it's written entirely in C Sharp and anything that needs to be compiled uh, is compiled into IL and then we run Mono compiles to JavaScript and WebAssembly in the browser. This is probably going to crash because Edge has been crashing lately. Let me try it over here. Maybe that was a Ruby program that left. <laughs> So this, this is, is a web, web app. Looks, looks great, great, works great. great. Written, written entirely in C sharp. C -sharp. And, and if I go in view source, source. That's, that's it. it. That's, that's, that's not really impressive, is it? It kind of sucks to view source and not see anything. anything. But, but if I hit F12, look at this. seen the graphics on your company's website <laughs> if your CEO's headshot is bigger than 800k uh, plus you can cache it so you don't get to complain about that being big and then look how small the DLLs are we actually ship the DLLs all the way over there and then they run in the browser Isn't that cool so what else could one potentially do if you can get something to run anywhere Smuggle this through security for you. This is a Raspberry Pi in a case called a Crow Pi. And it's got screens and LEDs and stuff like that. And then, does somebody have a micro USB cable that I can borrow? Micro. The old style Android one. Give me some. I'll have a race. That one? Where's my giant battery? Do you want one? No, I have a giant battery. I will take your cable. I have a power bank. Uh, I'm looking for mine because mine's expensive. Let's go. <laughs> oh, I got the cable. Yeah. All right. And let me find a horribly expensive power bank. Hang on. The gentleman outside. He, he run up. <laughs> That's, That's a power bank. If anybody tries to give you trouble in Prague, you can hit him with that. This is a backup battery for my house. <laughs> I can actually run the entire suitcase off of power bank, and it runs Raspberry Pi. It's really great for learning, especially if you played with Raspberry Pi and you find that all the cords and the wires and the sensors are hard to set up. The whole thing is self-contained. Then. Got a tiny keyboard, a tiny mouse, and this can run .NET. And what I can do, I'll show you as we go and search for Raspberry Pi Hanselman. Sorry. And what we do is .NET 
publish. So what that means, we're actually publishing a specific .NET. We're saying I want to publish the entire .NET uh, runtime for this environment. We're packaging it all up and we're putting the whole runtime, our app plus the runtime, into a uh, folder. Then, then I can, I can go, go and SSH, SSH or SCP, I guess, secure copy that, that whole thing over to um, a machine like this. And I'm going to open up a terminal here. I'm afraid I don't have this. Actually, wait a second. I can probably get on Moss's Wi Fi. Can you give me your password again? <laughs> I've got like four machines on this very nice gentleman's phone. Uh, this is so bad. bad. Sorry, Sorry, sir. sir. <laughs> You're a legend. <laughs> All right, hang on. You have to change your password when we're done. All right, let's see if that worked. And if I was going to make a 
light, light blink. blink. That's, That's a little, little bit over the top. This is, this is overpowered. This is a quad processor, four gig of RAM computer. It's, it's adorable. It's, it's a toy. It costs, it costs like twelve dollars, but it's more than is appropriate for IoT. So you know the difference, students, in the third row between a microprocessor and a microcontroller. What is the difference? Operating systems. What? You're not, you're not a student. Uh, what do you say? Operating system. Operating system. Is there one or not? <coughs> a microprocessor is a computer. It's a full-on machine. If I'm going to go and do a little IoT project like blink a light, do I need to go and also SSH into my machine and keep it up to date? Should you be able to install like Word on the same machine that's blinking the light? No, you want to have it do as little as possible. So a microprocessor is a full-on computer. A microcontroller, on the other hand, is a tiny little thing that rather than booting into an operating system, like Linux, it boots into your program. It boots into a tiny, thin little thing. So here's a thing called the Meadow. This is a microcontroller. I'm going to start with four AA batteries and a USB adapter. So I'm turning those into USB power, because I'm silly like that. Then, oh, it turns out I had a cable. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Where's yours? <laughs> I'm get it back. Hang on. So then we take this. This is from a company called Wilderness Labs, who apparently is being shamed by the mirror effect. And now we can. Where's that? Where are you? Okay. Wilderness Labs. Okay. And this is a microcontroller. <coughs> with, with an Adafruit screen that is actually running C sharp. So this is going to take a second to boot up because it's actually booting up A.NET. And this thing is going to run off of these batteries for weeks. Now, I like to make little hello world applications when I'm learning, you know, IoT like this. It's one thing to get a blink a blinking light, but it's another thing to solve a problem in your, in your life. The problem that I have is that I keep leaving my garage door open. I have my car in the garage, I open the door, I drive away, I come back hours later and the garage door has been open and I feel that maybe someone has taken my stuff. So what I wanted was an app that would text me when I left the garage door open. So I made a device that would, I would tape it to the garage door. And the garage would go like this and then turn as it goes up. And it would detect if it rotated 90 degrees. And then text me, you left the garage door open. Pretty simple. Do I need a full installation of Linux to do that? Probably not, right? What this is, is this is I don't know how to say this in Czech. This is a rock, paper, scissors. Do you have that? Yeah. Yeah? So it's rock, paper, scissors, and it's playing rock, paper, scissors on the phone. Except it's playing the complicated version. Rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. It's a much more complicated version. And you can get the code up at uh, aka.ms. Rock, rock, paper, paper scissors, scissors, lizard, spot. spot. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's, That's just a standard, standard thing. thing. And the code for that is very straightforward. This is not complicated stuff. i show you that code real quick. And then we can do some questions and get you all back to work. It's really interesting. Although, it does bring up some interesting questions. Something harmless like that. Oh, draw text. I can do that. Cool, right? Where does that actually come from? Well, we don't have an operating system. So that's the font. 
Because the font is actually a bitmap font. It's the pixels for each character. So we, so we actually had to write a program to generate the fonts. And there's different colored fonts, or different sizes, rather. This one is a uh, 12 by... This is 12 by 16, and there's a 4 by 8. Each one of these is a different generated font. You'll find that a lot in microcontrollers like this because they don't have true type. You can't download a 200K or you know, 2 megabyte font. The whole thing only has 2 megabytes. But once you get those libraries, and you can get them they're all open source, you can use the full power of C Sharp. You hide all of the complexity from yourself, and you just do stuff like this. Here it is, you know, player one, player two, clear the buffer, draw a rectangle, play the game, get image for hand. It's pretty straightforward. It's low level. But you're doing WPF and C Sharp at work. You could do this in a day. Right? You're learning Hello World, you could do this as well. Everyone who is a C Sharp developer can write console apps, Windows apps, Linux apps, IoT apps for microprocessors like the Raspberry Pi, microcontrollers like the Meadow, container apps, Kubernetes. There's literally nothing that you can't do. It will run on a Nintendo Wii if you want to run .NET on one. You can write watch apps, iPhones, Android, whatever makes you happy. So we're having a whole lot of fun with this stuff right now. And I realized I haven't shown you any slides. So I'll just show you one. <laughs> one slide that I will show you will be the roadmap for the next four years. And then we'll do questions and get out of here because they're way over time. Okay. Dotnet Core 3 came out, 3.1 came out today, long term support. Every odd numbered year will be another long term support. That will coincide with Ubuntu and Linux that also does long-term support. So this means break things, stabilize. Break things, stabilize. You innovate on the even number of years, and you stabilize on the odd number of years, and you have three years of support. So the one that we just released today will be fully supported until 2022. And upgrading is trivial. Isn't that cool? So then we can tell you that .NET 8 will be out in 2023. Runs on a half dozen Linuxes, also runs in the browser. So if you want to go and learn more about this stuff, I also want to remind you that I just went out and put these videos together. If you go to .NET slash videos, we did 100 videos. These are all very quick YouTube videos. There's 19 on C Sharp 101. You can maybe learn some stuff, even if you know C Sharp. We did eight on .NET Core. We did 13 on ASP.NET Core. We did one on Docker. We did ones on .NET Core versus the framework. We've got new ones coming out. We even got .NET on things like Apache Spark. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening right now in the .NET space. Uh, is that cool? Awesome. Useful use of your afternoon? Cool. I'm losing my voice now, I'm afraid. <clears throat> cool. cool. So, so I have to shut all this stuff down now while I'm doing that. If anyone has any questions, maybe we can pass the mic. Yes. yes. Uh, so you are showing multiple distributions in Microsoft Store. It's sometimes inside try to call a distribution running inside Windows. However, Windows Defender, like, correctly mark all those libraries as viruses. Yeah, yeah probably should. should. Because they are penetration. Yeah. yeah. Therefore, Therefore, turn off Defender when you're doing that kind of work. <laughs> Seriously. That's the only way how to do it? Think well, think about what you just said. Yeah. Windows, Windows Defender correctly marked security penetration tools as threatening. Yeah. I mean, like if you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Yeah. The doctor says, don't do that. Is there like any option how to just like ignore some of the folders where the 
you can go and exclude the folders, you can exclude the binaries, you could probably run it under WSL2 and exclude the entire subsystem, <coughs> but it doesn't mean that you won't get suspicious behavior flagged by Defender. Defender, Defender has two phases, the basics and the advanced, right? Suspicious behavior is suspicious behavior. So if you're doing naughty things with Kali Linux, Defender will notice. So turn it off. Yes, sir. Good question. I ask, cause what, what is coming in .NET 5? What are the new features we should be looking for? The feature, the feature that we just shipped in 3.1 that is going to be better in .NET 5, and the one that I'm most excited about, is called a single file exits. So rather than me taking um, an application and compiling it and putting it into a folder, so I have like 100 files in a folder, I want a single executable. It says myapp.exe. And I want to be able to put it on a USB key and give it to someone and have it just work, even if they don't even have .NET installed. And then I want it to be as small as possible. Right now, the average .NET app, even a Hello World, is about 150 megs. We should be able to get it down to about 15 megs. Including gar garbage collection. Including everything, because you would shake it. You do what's called tree trimming. And you shake off all of the functions that you don't call. So you would not ship any functions that you don't use, thereby <coughs> shipping a private, smaller version of .NET that includes only the bits that it needs to run and no more. That is in preview now and should be baked in uh, .NET 5. And then also in .NET 5, we should, hopefully, if we can do it, have .NET native working, where we compile it literally into a native executable. So AOT versus JIT. And Blazor is also coming. And then Blazor right now works is a release on the server, and we should have the client version with WebAssembly done by uh, then as well. Yeah, it's a pretty cool time. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. Yes. Why should you move to .NET instead of GoLang? You can move to GoLang if you want to. I don't mind. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. Golang, I think Golang is really the new, the new C. You know, it has its, you know, I think that the biggest, one of the biggest tricks that C ever played on the world was convincing it that it didn't have a runtime. And Go does the same thing. Like, there's always a runtime. There's always some structure. There may not be a full jitter, and there may not be a full virtual machine. But, but you know, Go, Go is, is great. I think Go is lovely. Go makes a lot of things work like Kubernetes. Why should you work, uh, do it on .NET? If C Sharp makes you happy, do that. Here's the deal. And I'll just use this as an example. So don't, don't take this the wrong way. We're just having, having fun. Why do you, you speak Czech, right? Why? It's not going to win. <laughs> you, should probably speak, you should probably speak Chinese. It's, Chinese is going to win, though, right? Like, why should I speak Czech? Same thing with the question you asked me. Like, why should I do C sharp? Why should you go? It makes you happy. It's your culture, right? Uh, why should you do Scala? Why should you do Rust or anything? You know, because it makes you happy. Like, they're not going to win. But there's room for all these different cultures. So I think C Sharp is a compelling culture. It's an interesting culture. It has a very intense culture of reuse. C Sharp people really like um, reusing code. You can get 40, 50, 70% of your code reused across platforms if you have just the UI done. On you can write an app once, run it on Android, Windows, Linux, all there's even cross platform implementations of WPF, like Avalonia. And there's Uno. Like we've got a really exciting community. Those are reasons. Uh, I know that you could probably write a iPhone app in Go, but I don't think they're quite there yet. Like Go's more for microservices. So use the one that makes you happy. That, that's my honest answer. I'm not trolling. There's room for there's room for all of us. Yes, question in the back. I have a podcast, and the question is, uh, I have a show called This Developer's Life. It was a storytelling show. We don't have any sponsors, and I have a full-time job. So unless I get someone to sponsor us, it takes about 50 hours to edit an episode of This Developer's Life. There's about 
20 that you can go listen to, but until Rob and I get someone to let us take vacation and record a show, there probably won't be any for a while. We need to find the time to do that. But I appreciate that all these years later you still enjoy that show, because it was a really good show. Thank you for that. Yes? That brings me to the other question. Like, you, you blog about all these personal projects, and they all envy you. When, when do you do them? When do, when do I, I do them? Yeah. I do them when the children are sleeping. What about your wife? She sleeps too. <laughs> <laughs> when do you sleep? Do I sleep? <laughs> or, or how much time do you Tell us more. I want to point out the date. Here's something I will leave you to think about, though. Don't compare your productivity to my productivity or how much I blog or you blog or whatever, but here's the thing. I have blogged twice, twice a week, Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Since, Since 2002. 2002. I'm going to hold down the space bar. That doesn't mean that I'm smarter or faster or more productive than any of you, even though I'm still holding down the space bar. <laughs> it means that I don't stop. I'm not asking you to blog every day. If you each, young people, I'm looking at the young people, if you blogged once a week, once a week for a year, that's 50 pages. If you did that for 10 years, that's 500 blog posts, and you will be a famous blogger. The only difference between me and you is that I never stopped. Pick an amount, one, two, whatever. Not five. Nobody can, oh, you know, like everyone, you, you know how when you go to your friend's blog and the last blog post is from four years ago and it says, I'm back and I'm going to blog again. I'm rededicating myself to blogging. We set up these failure systems. Blog once a week. You know, do you run every day? If you do, you're amazing. But if you can run once a week, you will be healthier than if you don't. I've podcasted 700 episodes every Thursday for 15 years. If I podcasted daily, I would have failed by now. I'm picking things that I enjoy. I'm doing them instead of things I don't. So if you were going to email me after this, and you're going to say, hey, Scott, great stuff. I have a question. I don't know you. You seem very nice. But I'm not going to write you back 5,000 of my keystrokes. I only have so many left. I'm going to die one day. And I have a finite number of keystrokes <laughs> left in my hands before I die. But if you ask an amazing question, that's a gift. Because I could then write a blog post about it, same number of keystrokes, and then send you a link to that. And then if two people visit it, my keystrokes just double, and I didn't do anything. Some of you don't blog because you say, well, what am I going to talk about? No one visits my blog. I only had 10 visitors last week. That's 10 emails you didn't have to send. That's 10 times the keystrokes. Pick up a system. You make it reliable. Once a week, the kids are asleep, the wife is asleep, the husband's asleep. Do your thing that you do. Do a YouTube, do a podcast, do a whatever. It doesn't matter if anybody's listening or not. You saw how I was Googling and I put my name there. That's not just a joke. That's so I can look up stuff that I forgot. I've been blogging for 20 years and I can go and Google my own brain with code samples? Why would you not have a blog? Put your keystrokes anywhere but email. And you will be someone that everyone will think is productive. The only reason that you think that I'm doing a lot is because I'm not sending emails. <laughs> like if someone came up to me yesterday, they had a question about WSL, and I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to make it a YouTube video, and that YouTube video will turn into a podcast, which will turn into a blog post, and I only had to do it once. Does that make sense? I didn't want to lecture you, but I am very passionate about that. Productivity is a myth. I was on Netflix for six hours last night at the hotel. I was hanging out. I was chilling. I wasn't like trying to be super productive. 
you, you, you plan and you do the plan and you plan to hang out, you plan to relax, <coughs> but then when you are working, you run, you sprint as fast as you can. Very good question. Thank you for that. I think, I think we're, we're done. Is that cool, everybody? All right. All right. Do we have to put the seats back? How do we work? People want us to put the room back. As it is, we can leave it in. All right. Cool. Thank, Thank you for having me, my friends.